become a physician, one must go through years of rigorous education and training. Many sleepless nights studying for exams, months or even years spent in hospitals, clinics, and specialty services. Training that involves seeing as many common and sometimes out of the ordinary medical events as possible. As patients, we trust our doctors to help us stay as healthy as possible and to have the knowledge to be able to identify what is wrong with us when we become ill or disabled. Many of our medical care providers are young, and the training that they receive in school includes treatments for trauma and diseases that are prevalent in today's society. A growing number of us, however, are aging, and we may have experienced former epidemic diseases with which health care providers of today have little or no preparation. In the mid-20th century, polio was at its peak. Anyone born in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s will remember the urgency surrounding people receiving the newly developed polio vaccines. In 1958 alone, 52,000 cases of polio were diagnosed, mostly in children ages 5 or younger. Of those 52,000 victims, over 3,000 deaths occurred and more than 21,000 of the survivors were temporarily or permanently paralyzed. People who lived through the annual summer epidemics of those decades of the 40s and 50s are, most likely, the last Americans to remember the absolute terror that surrounded this dreaded disease. The quarantine homes, the iron lungs, the crippling paralysis, and the many deaths. Most of our young people today know little about polio, yet, as of August 2014, at the time of this documentary was being made, the World Health Organization had already positively identified 146 infectious cases of polio in half a dozen countries. The question becomes, when is it safe to begin ignoring an extremely contagious disease like polio, socially and medically? Polio is a illness due to a virus infection. And like most viruses, there are many vaccinations available. In modern times, there's both an injectable vaccination and there's an oral vaccination. In most Western countries, we are using the injectable vaccination because it is easy to administer and is very reliable in preventing polio with no side effects to the vaccine. Even though polio is no longer an annual summer epidemic in the United States, polio is still not eradicated from the world. It would only take one active case of polio entering this country to spark an outbreak, especially following the alarming drop in vaccination rates of vulnerable American children over the past 25 years. But even if active infectious polio were to never return here, its legacy lives on in those who were once infected with the disease in the newly identified form of post-polio syndrome. What is this strange residual from the deadly polio virus? Dr. Robert Tello explains. There are three strains of the polio virus that have been isolated over the years through research. However, the two most important strains in modern times would be number one and number two. These viruses tend to get into the spinal cord and will cause what has been called paralytic polio. About five to ten percent of polio survivors had paralytic polio. And these are the patients who are at such high risk for developing post-polio syndrome which is manifested by weakness of muscles throughout the body, including the arms, the legs, the diaphragm, the abdomen, the back. Because of this neuromuscular disease, it will cause symptoms later in life, usually 20 to 30, perhaps 40 years after the original polio infection. And it causes symptoms because of what is usually thought to be an overuse syndrome. So what do I mean by that? Basically, it goes like this. When you have a polio attack that causes paralysis or severe weakness of the muscle tissues of the body, you tend then to overuse the other muscles that were not so much affected by the polio. The overuse of the other muscles that were not affected by the polio eventually causes a burnout syndrome in which these muscles now become weak and painful, causing fatigue, 
and almost like a recurrence of the original polio syndrome when they had the acute infection. However, now it is due to overuse of muscles over the years. Post-polio syndrome, or PPS, is a condition that affects an estimated 40% of polio survivors in different ways and to varying degrees. It's these different manifestations of the illness of which doctors need to be aware, and why a complete and thorough medical history is important. Some of the issues surrounding this is explained by Dr. Marnie Yulberg. Basically, um, post-polio syndrome is a condition that affects Probably the best data, about 40% of people who had polio. Um, we used to think that people had polio, they had a certain amount of weakness, then they got a certain amount of recovery, usually the maximum in about three or four years after the acute illness. Um, and then they went on that way the rest of their life. Um, we're finding that that's not true for everybody, but again, the best statistics are that that's tr still true for about 60% of people who had polio. Um, the other 40% may develop what is termed late effects of poliomyelitis or post-polio syndrome. And that's there are certain criteria for making that diagnosis. Um, the main criteria are that somebody needs to have had paralytic polio. And there gets to be this question about folks who had non-paralytic polio of whether they could develop post-polio syndrome. But the, the challenge is identifying who those people were. Um, because if you didn't have any paralysis, how do, how do we know you had polio? Um, we, could, we can look at immunity at antibody status, but I don't know how many of you all, um, but I had the disease and then I got both of the vaccines. Um, so when I have antibodies and immunity to polio, the question is, is that from my disease? <laughs> how much of that's from my disease and how much of that's from my immunization? So if somebody was, say, Christian scientist and never got any immunizations, then we could look at antibody studies and see if they really had immunity and assume that they had non-paralytic polio. And indeed, about 90%, 90, 95% of people who had polio and developed immunity to that type of polio virus did not ever have any uh, paralysis. It really is a small percentage, like maybe 5% of the folks who had polio that developed some paralysis. Um, not only are there different ways in which symptoms are managed, but doctors need to be aware of other normally life-saving procedures that could be potentially life-threatening to a person suffering from PPS. Polio and post-polio are both really painful conditions and with chronic pain it's important again that you use a lot of resources. Physicians who are not prescribing opiates uh, but instead looking for alternatives like heat and cold, pos body positioning, uh, using physical therapy has been wonderful with a person who knows a lot about polio uh, muscle activation has been terrific, and many physical therapists know about that. Acupuncture, massage for some people um, are important. Another pain management uh, opportunity is to get out, uh, join a service organization like Rotary, and be involved with a community, a warm community, an active community. Uh, help other people, and uh, that is probably the best medicine there is. The optimal treatment of PPS symptoms may include some collaborative efforts that new physicians would find especially beneficial to post-polio patients. It is very common that post-polio syndrome patients may not choose to seek the advice of many ancillary health professionals. I believe that every post-polio syndrome patient should see not only their PCP, but also a pulmonologist, a physiatrist, a chiropractor, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, 
and a psychotherapist. All of these specialists can help a post-polio syndrome patient deal with their multitude of symptoms. Doctors, hear the cries of your patients and learn what needs to be known about post-polio syndrome and about helping these people improve their quality of life. I'm Scott Wheeler, urging us all to relieve suffering and maximize health. Stay healthy.